Shanghai, or should I say Shanghai? No, no, I shouldn't say that.、Um, anyways, keeping with the theme of filming these intros from places that have nothing to do with the flight, for those of you who are not illiterate, you probably already know what this is going to be about. So let's just jump right into this flight. For those of you who are not familiar with the skyline, I'm in Shanghai this week, which marks the end of a long commute that involves circumnavigating the globe. Our journey begins two weeks back in Toronto with a hop across the proverbial pond. Our route takes us over the Maritimes and onto the North Atlantic tracks, flying from the colonies into the seat of the empire, London. A seven-hour journey totaling 3,540 miles. This flight is going to be on British Airways' brand new A350-1000 in their business class, branded as Club Suites. Vicarious Voyager is committed to doing its part in being environmentally friendly, so that's why I'm recycling the city and airport explainers from my last video. Toronto's Pearson International Airport is actually mostly located in the adjacent city of Mississauga. It is accessible via a network of roadways and is connected to the subway system via an express bus service. But by far the fastest way to get to the airport from the city would be the Union Pearson Express Rail Service, linking Terminal 3 with Union Station. There are two stops along the way, providing access to the public transit system. The airport itself is split into two terminals, numbered one and three. BA operates at a terminal three, which, despite its name, is the older of the two buildings. Each terminal has its own domestic, international, and pre-cleared U.S. Customs and Immigration area. To transfer between the two, you have to go landside and take a monorail. I know this is genius. British Airways operates a couple flights daily out of Pearson, and when I say couple, I mean two. Regardless, they have a sizable check-in area and have the desks reserved for priority status holders and business class passengers. Check-in was easy enough, and then it was straight through security. Fast track was available to business class passengers, and the rest was a breeze. Once airside, it was a beeline to the lounge. On the way, I couldn't help but stop and stare in awe at this sign: Uber Eats in an airport terminal, so you don't have to walk five minutes to the food court. This is incredible. What a time to be alive! The lounge was tucked into a corner, one floor above departures. BA's lounge is a contract from Plaza Premium, but instead of using the main lounge, passengers were directed to this smaller, purpose-built contract space. It's staffed by Plaza Premium, but was dedicated to British Airways passengers during our departure times. It was split into two sections: first and business, with Executive Gold and One World Emerald holders having access to the first-class area. We had neither, so off we went to the proletariat section. All joking aside, this lounge was pretty good. It wasn't very big, but it was well appointed. The highlights would have to be these big windows that offered expansive views of downtown Mississauga, two runways, and the aprons. And here is a KLM A330 bound for Amsterdam. And just like British Airways, KLM is also celebrating its centenary this year. There are plenty of drinks on offer, including a fully staffed bar with wines, spirits, cocktails, and beers on tap. There was also a cafe-style communal table with power outlets and USB ports, and additional seating in the back. For a small lounge, the buffet was pretty good, with plenty of options and lots of hot food. I dare say that the food here is probably better than what you get in the International Maple Leaf Lounge over in Terminal One. If you're feeling healthy or not that hungry, there are also snacks and flavored waters. And here is the aircraft that will be taking us to London, a two-month-old Airbus A350-1000. A few minutes before the stated boarding time, we headed downstairs to the gate area. With there being a limited amount of space, there was only two queues for boarding: zones one through three, and then everyone else. Boarding was conducted through one bridge, which led to the L2 door. On the A350, business class is split into two cabins: the main one at the front and a smaller one behind that. And here is my seat for tonight, 9A. These new suites are miles better than the old seats in BA's club world. They are a variant of the Collins Aerospace Super Diamond seats, very similar to those found in WestJet and Americans business classes. These, however, have a door, which we will get to later. The seat slash bed is comfortable, and I'm glad they use fabric instead of leather. The whole suite does feel very private, but can feel a little claustrophobic with the door closed. Let's now do a comprehensive seat tour. As always, let's start off with the leg room. Lengthwise, there was plenty of space. I'm 181 centimeters, or for you Americans, 181 centimeters, and I had no problem stretching out, even in bed mode. In terms of width, it was a little tight. Over here on the outboard side was a small cubby hole behind which you will find the safety card. 
And stowed below the display is the tray table which can be released like this. It folds out to give you more surface area and is sturdy enough. It also locks into two different positions allowing you to easily get out of your seat even during meal times. And it stows away flush under the screen unlike some other variants of the seat. And moving on to the side console, push this button to access the forward cubby hole in which we will find the media controller, we'll have a more in-depth look at this later. There's also a universal power outlet and a USB charging port, as well as a trickle charge USB port and headphone jacks. Do remember to press down hard to lock the lid in place. And let's move on to the rear cubby hole. This one is much shallower, but it's kind of perfect for storing the contents of your pocket, such as phones, passports, and loose change. And let's move on to the last compartment back here. This one's kind of strange. There is a vanity mirror in here, but not much space for anything else. The magazine rack intrudes into the space weirdly, and that's about all there is to it. And while we're back here, there's this adjustable reading lamp, which I'm pretty sure many of you are already familiar with. All right, what's next? Um, oh yeah, the seat controls. There are three physical presets for takeoff, lounging, and lay flat positions, with the rest being in the touchscreen menu, which you have to press twice to access. There are only two sections of the seat that you can control the backrest and the footrest, which seems a little lackluster. And this little light control here, it didn't seem to turn on any of the lights in my suite. It didn't work in my girlfriend's suite either, and upon asking the cabin manager, he said it's not supposed to work. Okay. Moving on to the aisle side, there is this armrest that can be raised or lowered, and despite many other airlines using this space for storage, BA didn't follow that path. I do like the stitching, although I'm not sure if it's gonna be very durable. I guess time will tell. We'll have to see how well these seats age, but I can tell you that the materials don't feel as premium as they look. Also, the inside of the suite walls are lined with this felt material, and while I'm sure it's good for absorbing sound, I would imagine it's very hard to clean. If you don't want a disease, fly economy. And also, sadly, there are no individual air gaspers. I almost missed it, but there is a coat hook. Yes, this is a coat hook. And finally, there is a door that works, most of the time. More on this later. Hot towels were handed out, followed by a welcome drink. I had the champagne. Soon enough, we were pushing back with the cabin crew asking us to attach our shoulder straps. As we were beginning our pushback, we were told there was a inconsequential 10 minute delay to our departure due to outbound traffic congestion. But it was more of a blessing in disguise as my camera and I got more time to enjoy the colors of the waning sunlight hitting the airport. The view from the sunset takeoff was possibly the best one I've ever witnessed, so I'll keep the whole thing in the video. If you're gonna be a bitch about it, I've kindly provided a timecode on the screen for you to skip to.
Immediately after the seatbelt signs were turned off, a flight attendant came around to take drink orders, and then another one came by after to take meal orders. This is a cranberry blush. It's vodka based and suited me quite well. And while you can taste the alcohol, the fruity tones balanced it pretty well. It came with some warmed up nuts and nibbles. It did take a while for the meal service to begin, but then I was offered another drink, and this time I went with the Gin Zing. With a hint of botanicals, it was really fresh and easy to enjoy. With a solid buzz on, let me show you the Club World menu, which looks like this. The first page features their cocktails list, as well as other prescriptions to get alcohol poisoning. At the bottom are some other less exciting beverages. The second page is a pretty substantial dinner menu, and on the right side are their breakfast offerings. While British Airways do offer a book to chef service, unfortunately it was not available on this route. The next spread was for wines, and while I expected them to have more variety, I learned that all the choices were solid premium offerings, so no complaints here. Also inside the menu was this breakfast card, which I filled out. However, no one ever came around to collect mine, and while someone did collect my girlfriend's, and having indicated on hers that she wanted to be woken up for her meal, she never was. Understandably, she was more than a little upset. A little bit over an hour after our orders were taken, the meal service began. The presentation of everything is really good, and I particularly thought the china they used is very cool. For the appetizer, I opted for the red pepper soup, which was served at the perfect temperature, and I quite liked it. It was accompanied by a small salad and a choice of bread. I then tried a few bites of my girlfriend's prawns and hummus, and while I liked it, she did not agree with me. For the main course, I got the bison, which was braised to perfection. The potatoes were done well, but the sauce wasn't as flavorful as it looked. Still a fantastic dish. The meat fell off the bones and melted in my mouth. It was really well done. The missus picked a vegetarian option, the cannelloni, which we both agreed was pretty good. Dessert was this hazelnut praline thing, which they call a rocher, or roche, however you pronounce it. It was surprisingly light and not too sweet, which made it my favorite part of the meal. Okay, meal over, let's now go and check out the bathroom. So, unfortunately, after having wrestled the shutter speed into obedience and preventing anyone from having an epileptic seizure, I forgot to press the record button. So, this is what the bathroom looks like to someone who is completely visually impaired. Fortunately for those of you who are not visually impaired, Matthew from liveandletsfly.com has kindly permitted me to use his photos of the bathroom. So, thank you Matthew, and this segment will now be in the format of a PowerPoint presentation. Here we go. The bathroom was roomy, brightly lit, and spotlessly clean. There were also tons of counter space so people such as myself who bring suspiciously big cameras in here have somewhere to place them when getting down to business. There were personal care products from the White Privilege Company and even an adjustable air nozzle. There was also a toilet, which I think kind of brings the whole place together. And that concludes our bathroom presentation. Once again, thank you to Matthew for the photos. I've linked his written review of his experience on this aircraft in the description below. If you're once again hungry after having gone to the bathroom, then you're in luck because right next to them is this snack and beverage bar. There is an unhealthy selection of sweet and savory snacks as well as soft drinks, sparkling water, juices, and wines. And directly next to it is this wine cooler, where you can help yourself to the champagne, rosé, and whatever else may be in here. Snacks acquired and diabetes confirmed, let's try out the in-flight entertainment. BA provides these ugly looking but adequately comfortable on your headphones. While they were noise cancelling, the seal wasn't very good due to it being on ear, so I didn't end up using them. The IFE remote packs tons of features, allowing you to browse the library of content or display an interactive route map, all while content is playing on the main screen. On the topic of the main screen, it's bright, big, and crisp, as you would expect from a brand new product. The menus were big and intuitive to navigate, and despite the route map boasting myriad virtual views, there were sadly no outboard camera feeds. The 
The movie selection was excellent, with most of the blockbuster new releases in stock, as well as a huge selection of movies from India, China, and everywhere else for the discerning international passenger. There was also an extensive library of classic and contemporary films to keep anyone entertained. You may also filter the selection by language, which is a surprisingly uncommon feature, but a very handy one for non-English users. TV shows were also available in abundance, and there was a sizable collection of British Airways productions to celebrate its centenary. In addition, there was a decent selection of games, some of which were multiplayer and you can play them with other passengers. There was a curated kit section with subject appropriate content, and for mom and dad a catalogue of the duty free available on board. However, a couple hours into the flight, the IFE system became very mm, lazy. First, it started with the remote, where after pressing on a menu selection, it took a whole three seconds for it to register. And over on the main screen, it became quite difficult to control the player. Sometimes it would straight up refuse to register any input, and at other times it was a game of cat and mouse between my finger and the cursor. This issue wasn't localized to my seat as a few other people in the cabin were also complaining about it, but it did seem to be endemic to this flight as I couldn't find any mention of it anywhere on the internet. So it's probably just teething pains and hopefully by the time you're flying on this product everything will be resolved. Anyways, once I got a movie playing there was really no more issues and the pause and play button did work well enough for me to use them. I then decided to get some rest, so let's check out the bedding. Apart from the pillow, all the bedding was once again provided by the white company and came in this very smart looking bag. The contents included this grey weighted duvet which was very comfortable. And if that's too thick for you, there's also this very soft blanket. In terms of comfort, both lived up to its name. And finally, you also got a mattress protector. The pillow was also really big, but that's definitely not a bad thing. There did not appear to be a turndown service, but that's absolutely fine, I don't need anyone to press a button for me. I'm pretty sure this mattress cover is meant for the older seats, but it does illustrate just how much bigger the new ones are. While it did feel cozy, there was more than enough space for my head, and because of the width of the seat and the thickness of the mattress, I could sleep on my side or back in comfort. And unlike some other variants of the seat, the high positioning of the tray table and TV screen meant that they did not get in the way of your legs when sleeping on your side. Although if I keep gaining weight, it might start to become a problem. And the door? Well, let's talk about the doors. Despite how it's marketed, in my opinion this door is perhaps not the best idea. For one, it makes the aisles very narrow, so people passing each other in the aisle can get very intimate. Another point is that they're not very high, so people walking in the aisle can see directly into your suite and this can lead to some awkward eye contact. And the doors themselves, well, they're quite cumbersome. Prior to landing, both my door and the one in front of mine wouldn't lock properly in the open position. It took two cabin crew and a 15 minute workout to secure them. During the flight, the door of a passenger a few rows in front of me also refused to open, and after a short episode of panic and two crew members pulling on it, it finally budged. So I mean, maybe they're more trouble than they're worth. And while I feel like I should tell you this, I myself didn't mind the door that much. Other than trying it out, I left it open and didn't feel exposed while sleeping. The bed was very comfortable and I got some solid rest. When I woke up, we were just passing the southern tip of Ireland. And on the horizon, you can see the faint glow of the city of Cork. Before breakfast gets here, let's take a look at the amenity kit, which is once again provided by the White Company and comes in this little pouch. And here are the contents inside. There was a pair of very high quality socks and an equally so eye mask. And the smallest of invitations to their store. Some cosmetics and a basic dental kit. They also included a pen and some earplugs. The whole kit is not great, but not terrible. I give it a rating of 3.6. A member of the cabin crew saw that I was awake and asked me if I wanted breakfast. A little while after having responded with a yes, this is what showed up. There was half a bagel with what they describe as scrambled eggs inside. It tasted good, but I do wonder as to whom was the recipient of the other half of my bagel. 
This muesli would have to be the highlight of this meal. It was simply sensational. If it wasn't for my social anxiety, I would have asked for another one. Who am I kidding? I don't have social anxiety. I'm here making a complete fool of myself on the internet with these videos and I'm completely comfortable with it. The coffee was also pretty good. Wi-Fi was available throughout the flight, but despite the download speeds being fast enough to watch YouTube videos, the cap data limit stopped any attempt. The biggest package was 150 megabytes for 18 pounds or 24 US dollars, which is very steep in the world of in-flight Wi-Fi. As we begin our approach into Heathrow, I'll use this time to share my conclusions on this flight. Firstly, the seat is solid, and you can sense that it was well thought out. It was comfortable as an upright chair, a lounger, and a bed. And despite not having many specific seat controls, I was always able to get comfortable. If you disregard the IFE system going on strike halfway through the flight, the content library is actually very impressive. The cabin crew were perhaps not completely familiar with this new business class concept, so we'll forgive them for the long dinner service and not waking up the girlfriend for breakfast, as I'm sure they'll improve. Otherwise, the flight attendants were very proactive and friendly. The door, well, I have nothing good to say about it, so I won't. If you do, please do leave a comment below and let the masses know. I was very excited for this flight, as the UK's flag carrier now offers a serious business class experience. If you have the cash for Avios the Splurge, I would recommend that you do. And once again, thanks for watching, happy travels, and see you next time.